we are live now good evening i am dr anil parik president medical affairs and clinical research at ipca it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege for me to welcome all the doctors uh, who have logged in for today's webinar and uh, the topic for today's webinar uh, is related to hypertension and thankfully it is not related to covid although hypertension being a very common comorbidity to covid but we are uh, discussing something different and which is uh, uh, very very relevant to us uh, the topic is uh, 2020 international society of hypertension ish global hypertension practice guideline and what is new and to uh, discuss the above topic we have a galaxy of experts among us and this uh, is uh, presided over by as a chairperson by dr gurpreet vendor and then uh, we have uh, dr venkatram dr gurpreet vendor has been also involved in the indian hypertension guideline dr venkatram who is also there amongst us today we are fortunate that he has been seen most of the global guidelines he has been part of various global guidelines and has reviewed various global uh, guideline then we have dr narsingan i think who has reviewed the these guidelines and then to give a clinicians insight and clinicians uh, we have a clinical expert uh, with us uh, dr rajiv agarwala so i think we will be getting a good discussion today uh, i'll just like to introduce dr gurpreet vendor although he is well known across the country because of his uh, association with api with csi and all that he is currently professor and head of cardiology at dayanand medical college and hospital he is coordinator of the hero dmc heart institute he has published more than 100 papers and almost 50% of them have been in a very very leading uh, journals like lancet nature genetics uh, jack uh, then uh, british heart journal and uh, all reading journals he has published and he has been also awarded dr k sharan cardiology excellence award by ima dr bc roy national award in 2006 and for development of specialties from uh, the president president pratibha uh, patil president of india and uh, he is a well recognized researcher from india we have very few researchers from original researchers from uh, researchers from our country and i am glad that dr gurpreet vendor is the real definition of doing research clinical practice as well as academic so he is, has got the right balance of all these three qualities so it's given me immense pleasure to now request dr gurpreet vendor to preside over today's uh, uh, discussion as a chairperson uh, welcome sir uh, dr gurpreet uh, thank you dr parekh uh, for the introduction and it is really nice that we are having a session on the 2020 global guidelines by the ish on hypertension and uh, it's uh, good that we are actually getting out of this covid business all the time discussing covid unnecessarily causing too much of anxiety and panic um, amongst people and we are actually uh, going to discuss a disease which is uh, the commonest public health problem in the world and uh, we are very fortunate in india to have an expert who is respected world over uh in the management of uh, hypertension dr c venkat ram is uh, spent most of his life in uh, america actually he was working in the texas uh, blood pressure institute in dallas and uh, he's been an associate and co-worker with dr norman kaplan he's been author of um, his books multiple editorials actually world over he is the most respected man on hypertension and any new developments in the field of hypertension are addressed uh, and critically evaluated by dr venkat s ram he is presently working as the director of apollo institute for blood pressure management and uh, apollo blood pressure clinics at hyderabad he is director of the world hypertension league um the who south asia he is editor in chief of uh, hypertension journal and he truly is uh, the person on whom we all look upon for critical evaluation of hypertension management principles you all know the american college of cardiology uh, acc aha came out in 2017 september with the guidelines which uh, uh kind of um, shook the world because they changed the definition of hypertension from 140 by 90 to 130 by 
and at that time actually the dr ram was invited for an editorial in circulation in which he actually um, associated me along with him then in 2018 we had the esc esh guidelines on hypertension and uh, sir was kind to take me along for the editorial that we that he wrote for the european um, journal and then in 2019 we came with our own indian guidelines and now we have this global guidelines uh, so it's always good to look at guidelines from across the world and these are actually the only guidelines which are suggesting management principles for all across the world and sir is going to address on what is new in the management of hypertension once again welcome to all the audience for this webinar and uh, we look forward to interaction and your questions after the uh, deliberation by uh, the distinguished speaker today professor c venkat esra over to professor c venkat esra okay shall i start yes yeah okay uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, good evenings and uh, greetings to all of you uh, for uh, joining in this program first i want to tell all the audience just to relax not to worry too much about uh, something new has come not to panic not to lose sleep it's a very very simple thing uh, about uh, guidelines uh, different guidelines but they're all talking about the same thing the terminology might change the publication vehicle might change but we're all talking about the same thing so i want to assure all of you that uh, you have not missed a great deal if you didn't read the last week's international society of hypertension guidelines i will try to make it very simple very practical very pragmatic ready to really apply in your practices and i will make some comments and we'll have plenty of time for discussion now last week uh, gurpreet and uh, was it was last week not last week uh, two days ago i participated in a covid uh, comorbidities uh, thing with uh, dr john mcmurray from glasgow and uh, yesterday i mentioned to you that he counted as of day before yesterday evening nearly 130000 publications on covid in last three months remarkable so i i don't know how many probably five or six are most useful Uh, having said that let us now turn our attention to the medical literature in general and then uh, what is happening uh, in the field of uh, hypertension uh, let me put this first slide uh, this is a slide showing how rapidly people publish and uh, how many publications come every year and uh, nobody can read all of these that is the reason why the programs of this nature in my opinion are very very important because of uh, people who participate who put the program together they have actually distill everything for the practitioners so one should not complain about medical education programs because medical education programs are really distilling what is required for you where you don't have to read that much it is almost like uh, a fruit you take the peel out of the fruit you cut the fruit and you put the pieces on a plate with a fork you just have to enjoy it so ladies and gentlemen just enjoy this program and get the best what you can do uh why i am not able to advance this uh, okay let me see if this does okay one thing that we always forget about hypertension we talk about the heart uh, with due respects to our panelists we talk about the kidney we talk about uh, brain when we talk about the brain we are only talking about cva but one of the most important complications of hypertension is dementia dementia is probably the most powerful complication of uh, hypertension we all uh, forget about it and we all relegate it to alzheimers or aging this is a study done uh, in europe called uh, systolic hypertension uh, 
uh, European uh, hypertension study, SISTIO, you will see the dementia score at the baseline, or let us call it cognitive function. And you will see that after successful treatment of systolic hypertension in the elderly, how the cognitive function has improved. So ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest things that you can do to your patients to prevent dementia or to improve the cognitive function is to treat hypertension. You don't need CT, you don't need MRI, you don't need carotid dopplers. And with all due respects to our neurology friends, you don't need neurological consultation. By the way, they don't even carry uh, uh, the hammer anymore uh, to check the reflexes. That's a different story. But uh, cognitive function improves when you treat hypertension. Very, very important to keep in mind. Now, all guidelines, including this guideline, uh, suggest the importance of non-logical treatment. And this is a very simple study, again, to tell all of us that when you lose weight, you can actually reduce the blood pressure. And similarly, you will notice that when you reduce the salt intake, this is from DASH uh, treatment uh, trial, with the reduction of salt, there is a nice reduction in blood pressure. Similarly, people who do regular exercise, aerobic exercise, you can lower the systolic blood pressure significantly. So ladies and gentlemen, this is only to convince you and me that non-pharmacological approaches, if they are followed, they do result in a fall in blood pressure, which is very, very important to tell the patients. Now, the reason why we treat hypertension with drugs is based upon this study called Veterans Administration Cooperative Trial, which was done in mid 60s to early 70s. This is a trial for the first time in uh, clinical medicine has shown that if you don't treat hypertension, namely placebo, there is a high risk of cardiovascular events. But if you treat hypertension, namely active with pharmacological treatment, you reduce the cardiovascular event rate significantly. This is the first time randomized double control study has shown untreated hypertension causes cardiovascular complications. When you control hypertension, you minimize the complications to reduce them. And this is a study that used actually combination therapy of a diuretic and sympathetic blocker and a direct vasodilator. I'll come back to combination therapy later on. So ladies and gentlemen, if this study was not done, we'll still be treating hypertension based upon your mood, based upon your preferences. But this is the one that showed Untreated hypertension is dangerous. Treated hypertension reduces cardiovascular complications. One more thing that we have to keep in mind in terms of the pharmacological principles is that whatever you do, you try to control the blood pressure 24 hours a day as much as possible because the morning rise in blood pressure is associated with cardiovascular complications. This is a a prospective study which will never be repeated again in our lifetime where they followed the patients with morning rise in blood pressure and without morning rise in blood pressure. You will notice those individuals who had morning rise in blood pressure had a high risk of cerebrovascular action. A prospective study showing following the people who had morning surge and those who did not have, those who had morning surge in blood pressure were at a high risk of developing cerebrovascular accidents. Now, this is a slide that myself and Dr. Wander together put uh, for a publication three years ago, where we compared the JNC, we compared the ACC, we compared the Indian Heart Hypertension Guidelines. You will notice there are some differences in terms of staging of the blood pressure and the goal blood pressure levels, but all do indicate that any blood pressure greater than 140 or 90 is detrimental. So there is an understanding that blood pressure greater than 140 or 90 is dangerous. There is, a, I wouldn't say a misunderstanding, there is a little bit of discussion whether the goal should be 130 as opposed to 140. And this is, I think this has been largely addressed by the recent guidelines and I will comment on this. Uh, the European uh, guidelines are very similar to Indian Society of Hypertension, uh, uh, the Indian Hypertension Guidelines. 
they have classified blood pressure at more than 140 or 90, but the goal blood pressure they have recommended is 130 by 80. So ladies and gentlemen, however you want to measure the BP, however you want to define hypertension, don't worry about it. You define it the way you want it. It does not matter. It is not illegal if you, if you subscribe to one definition, but it is very important that you achieve the goal blood pressure of less than 130 or 80, which is what the international guidelines also have recommended. Now, a number of studies have shown any blood pressure greater than 130 over a period of time can cause a number of complications. Over a period of time, a blood pressure greater than 130 is associated with cardiovascular risk because if somebody has 135, it doesn't remain 135. Ultimately, it becomes 140. If somebody has 140, it doesn't remain 140, it becomes 150. That is the reason why people took this artificial but important benchmark of 130 because about 130 feeds to itself, hypertension begets itself to a higher level, so BP. And this is a slide that myself and Dr. Wander discussed about it at uh, API in the plenary session, where we demonstrated that ideal blood pressure is 120 by 80, but any time you increase the blood pressure to 130 or 140, there is increase in cardiovascular mortality, stroke, coronary heart disease, myocardial infarction. So ladies and gentlemen, Ideal blood pressure or uh, utopia blood pressure, utopic blood pressure, 120 or 80 is desirable, but any time the blood pressure goes about 120, 130, 140, there's incremental cardiovascular risk because of multiplication of the blood pressure numbers over a period of time. Two to three millimeters increase in blood pressure multiplied by 60 times, multiplied by 24, multiplied by 365, is increased cardiovascular burden on the patient. Now, until now, I'm going to come to international guidelines now. Until now, the American guidelines, European guidelines, and more recently, the Indian guidelines, they varied in the definition, but the goal blood pressure is still 130 or 80 if you can achieve it. Uh, one thing that we have to know living in India is by nature of your genetic makeup, and Dr. Wander uh, has done a lot of work on genetics and is published also on hypertension. Uh, and Dr. J.P.S. Sani has done work on lipids uh, in South Asians and he has wonderful studies on genetics. So ladies and gentlemen, let us not forget about important investigators from India who have contributed to global literature. I know that sometimes we, for whatever reason, we don't recognize people in our own backyard. There are wonderful researchers who have done a lot of work and I'm going to refer to some studies. Being South Asian uh, does not offer you any advantage and does not offer you any protection. In fact, you're at a higher risk of complications. Now, the American uh, guidelines update last year has once again recognized Asians as having higher cardiovascular risk. I stated this before also, Asian is a very respectable word, which is basically they're talking about Indians. They don't have data about other South Asian countries. So, but, so that it does not appear too political, they use the word Asian, but all practical purposes, it is South Asian. And this is a slide uh, that actually uh, Dr. Gupta, Rajiv Gupta has put from Jaipur, where he has further documented hypertension is the driver of cardiovascular disease in this country. And this has also been confirmed by the studies from ICMR and Public Health Foundation of India. Now, if we look at the blood pressure the way it is, without containing it, I'm using containing because we're in the COVID uh, time where people talk about containment. If you don't contain the blood pressure the way it is, our uh, blood pressure will continue to increase significantly. From 120 million people, about 200 million people will have high blood pressure in the future in our country. Uh, this is a study that we have done, which is currently uh, submitted for publication for a major journal. 
we have prospectively studied in the Apollo group uh, patients coming with acute stroke to the emergency room. We didn't intervene with them. We did not change the treatment of hypertension or uh, stroke protocol. We didn't do anything. We only looked at the risk factors they had before they developed the stroke. And clearly hypertension is a leading risk factor for the stroke, which we knew already, but this is in a private, private hospital setting. We, myself uh, and Dr. Wander, in our previous uh, publications have suggested that uh, from the European guidelines and from the American guidelines, probably India is likely to benefit the most because they have recommended aggressive blood pressure goals. Now, let me uh, discuss with you the salient features of uh, the 2020 uh, in International Society of Hypertension that were published last week. I'm going to just give some salient features. Here, uh, they have used two terms which are quite unusual in guidelines. Usually guidelines use uh, evidence and the level of recommendation. Level of evidence, level of recommendation. But in departure to that, these guidelines have used essential or optimal because they wanted some of these guidelines to be more accessible and applicable in lower income countries and lower and middle income countries where uh, if they reach some optimal that could be accepted as opposed to essential. But I don't think this is a good terminology and I would like Dr. Narsingan to comment later on because uh, what happens in day-to-day -day clinical medicine Physicians really do not have that luxury of dividing medical care into essential and optimal. We don't have that kind of luxury when people are coming with blood pressure, diabetes, lipids. Uh, so this is a definition that is a little bit odd, but we can agree that it was done with good intent. And I, I really offer my salutations for them to reach Trying, trying to reach out to lower and middle income countries. Now, what they have done is very interesting. If you look at that bullet point one, very interesting bullet point, their own guidelines. They say stick to recent guidelines of European Society of Cardiology, European Society of Hypertension, ACC and American Heart Guidelines. I found this to be uh, very, very interesting, very transparent very transparent. They actually are suggesting stick to recent guidelines, but now they are defining essential or optimal in order to meet the facilities or availability in so-called low income, middle income countries. But the background they're suggesting is stick to the recent guidelines. That is interesting paradox really. And this is the definition uh, of uh, hypertension, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that international guidelines uh, have used very similar to Indian uh, guidelines that Dr. Wander uh, was uh, actually a, a main author. You will notice the normal blood pressure is less than 130 over 85. But later on, I'll show you that they have recommended a goal blood pressure of 130 by 80. So this is something that uh, people should pay attention, but uh, not try to dissect it the way I do, because this is my interest. But I don't think people should uh, dissect it that much. Normal blood pressure, 130, 85, but uh, goal blood pressure is 130 by 80. A little bit. Uh, one one comment that will come up during discussion is they have reintroduced the term prehypertension with different terminology, namely normal high, nor, high normal BP. High normal BP is nothing but previous prehypertension. But we didn't want the stigma of prehypertension and we removed it. But the International Society of Hypertension, for whatever reason, they have reintroduced this term uh, without using the phrase prehypertension. But what they're recommending for this is non-pharmacological treatment. 
So they're not recommending pharmacological treatment, but I do want uh, people to understand the word prehypertension, which was removed cleverly, has come back with equal cleverness under different name, normal high BP, which is uh, high normal BP, which has to be controlled if possible with uh, non-pharmacological treatment. And they do talk about measuring the blood pressure properly, which all of us should as much as possible. Uh, depends on the type of practice environment that you are in. If you are in a very, very business, uh, very busy practice, I don't know whether you really can take the three measurements on a given patient and take the average of the last two readings and the patient is in a seating position and the blood pressure be taken five minutes apart. This is very, very nice and uh, it is very altruistic. But can do in a practice, especially for a condition called hypertension, which is so common in general practice, very common in general practice, very common in physicians, very common. But nevertheless, if one can follow this, that's great. One can follow this, that's great. But I, I have not seen this being followed uh, that much due to the at least in urban settings, this kind of a thing is very difficult. The most important thing is use the proper machine and as much as possible use automated machines so that you minimize the manual error. Now, they have uh, emphasized the importance of white coat hypertension and mast hypertension like other guidelines. They, they, nothing new, but importance, especially this is more important in the urban setting. It's hard to apply in rural setting. And non-pharmacological treatment they have recommended, which I have already alluded to in the beginning, very important. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the guideline committees work very, very hard. And sometimes they work overdrive. When you work overdrive, sometimes you end up getting these kind of algorithms. Uh, nothing wrong with it, but they must have corrected this at least 50 to 100 times. But with each correction, probably it became more complicated, not that simple. So you can look at this diagram only to view that the first step would be lifestyle, but then the rest of the steps, I'm going to go through it very quickly because this kind of an algorithm, uh, you don't really have to refer to in your day-to-day -day practice a simple measurement of blood pressure. And then based on the blood pressure, you really can render appropriate advice. In fact, uh, I want to deviate from my remarks and I want to mention now, I can mention it publicly, doesn't matter. Blood pressure measurement will give you a good idea whether to treat or not. But once you go into risk profiling, Framingham score, renal score, nobody does that. I must admit, nobody does that. I have asked at one meeting, thousand doctors were sitting. I said, I will close my eyes. Please raise your hand if you follow any scoring system before guiding the patient to lower the BP. Somebody told me there were hardly 10, 15 people. Nothing wrong with scoring system. Very good, lipids diabetes, family history, male gender, tobacco, body weight, very important. But you don't get carried away by risk calculators. They're very good for epidemiology. They're very good for public health. But when you are dealing with a patient with elevated blood pressure, that elevated blood pressure itself is good enough to do the rest of it. The segment on drug treatment of hypertension in these guidelines uh, is uh, actually quite small. The segment is very small. Uh, after non-pharmacological treatment, they suggest a low dose combination therapy uh, of a RAS blocker and a calcium blocker. I want to comment on beta blocker and diuretic shortly. Step two, they talk about full dose combination. Step three, triple combination, I'll talk about it. Step four, this is very standard to all the guidelines. 
So they also recommend that fix dose combination, if possible, should be used. So nothing, nothing different about it. The one thing that you might want to comment or you might want to critique, uh, including our uh, distinguished panelists, uh, you feel free to critique. Uh, when I say critique, it doesn't mean condemn. We never condemn any guidelines because a lot of hard work and I offered my salutations right in the beginning. But critique is very important for anything because we're dealing with blood pressure, which is very, very common in clinical practice. We are not uh, dealing with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, with metastasis to the bone, and with the metastasis to the skin. We're not talking about that. Uh, although, we, although we want such patients also to do well with appropriate treatment, we're talking about very common condition. Hypertension like weather, very, very common, like bananas, or in, in this season, mangoes. Uh, very, very common thing. We're not talking about unusual fruit when I see mangoes. So, when you look at hypertension, uh, you really, once you take the blood pressure, you do what is right for the patient without really, for example, I don't know how many doctors really would make the diagnosis of hypertension according to these guidelines over two to three office visits spread one to four weeks apart. How many of us will really do it uh, you might want to do it to a relative or to somebody who, to me, all patients are VAPs, but somebody who is a very sensitive type of patient, you might want to do that. But two to three office visits, one to four weeks apart to treat a condition as simple as hypertension, some patients really don't come back after three to four weeks. That is a problem we have. So, I mean, please do what is right for the patient, but these are my comments. And this is a very important slide, uh, probably a take home uh, message in this is if uh, lifestyle changes do not work, uh, then obviously drug treatment is there. If you look at optimal treatment for people less than age 65, they talk about 130 by 80. So ladies and gentlemen, especially in a country like India, where there's a lot of people under the age of 65. The ideal blood pressure appears to be, optimal blood pressure is 130 by 80. So you, now you recall the definition of hypertension, 130 by, I mean, 130 by 85 is abnormal, 140 by 90 is hypertension. Those are small numbers, let's not argue about it. But you look at target, blood pressure under the age of 65, 130 by 80. This is very, very important because this is in line with the previous recommendations. One thing we should also admire, I do, for people older than 65 years of age, they have recommended 140 by 90. Whereas some of the previous guidelines, they suggested if possible, 130 by 80. But this is actually a very sensible one. This is very, very sensible and I must commend the writing committee, that they suggested under 140 or 90 is fine, you, but you don't have to push them to 130 by 80. That's what they're saying. And this is very, very good. One difficulty that uh, the audience will have is the essential blood pressure reduced by 20 by 10 millimeters. But they don't tell us what is the blood pressure that is measured when you're recommending 20 by 10. If it is 150 by 100, I have no problem. But let us say somebody has 200 or 110, which is, by the way, very common, very common, 200 over 110. That means you are suggesting bring it down to 180 by 90, 180 by 100. So somebody who has 200 or 110, you are saying bring it down to 180 to 100. That is very severe hypertension. So you could argue with this reduced BP by 20 by 10. You can say that for stage one hypertension, but when patient has significant hypertension, this 20 by 10 doesn't count because when you lower it, they still are hypertensive. 
So keep that in mind uh, when you when you read the guidelines. There is nothing new about emergencies and urgencies. Uh, classically, they have done a good job. One thing they have commented is South Asian population is at high risk for cardiovascular metabolic disorders in Indian subcontinent. So, ladies and gentlemen, four guidelines now in a row. American guidelines, European guidelines, Indian guidelines, and international guidelines have identified us as a high risk group. And uh, it is not a badge of honor, but it is a badge of responsibility that you treat hypertension aggressively so that we remove the stigma that South Indian hai, isko BP hai. I saw that stigma we have to remove, you know, are to Indian bhagra hai, BP ke saath bhagra hai. We have to reduce that stigma in the future. Narsingan, if I want, I will, I will translate that to you in Tamil later on. So let me then make the slide simple from BBS before. This is, I have actually taken the University of Hypertension Algorithm. Normal blood pressure, one third, less than 130 by 85. But the goal blood pressure, 130 by 80. Now they recommend if the BP is greater than 130 or 85, they recommend out of office blood pressure or ABPM. And this is something that you have to think about it because the guidelines are more towards low income and middle income countries. When you're recommending guidelines for low income, middle income countries, now we are recommending out of office BP and ABPM. And that is going to be a dilemma because it is the same countries where out of office BP and ABPM will be very difficult. Even as it is now in our own country, very few doctors do ABPM. Very few doctors do ABPM. Even people who have ABPM machines, they don't do it. I do it because of my interest. But even in large centers, you know, Dr. Wander, Dr. Narsingan, and uh, Dr. Gupta, you all see patients. But I don't think you jump to ABPM just because somebody has 130 by 85, is ABPM we don't do that. So that is a very paradoxical recommendation for low income and middle income countries. Now out of office ABPM, uh, out of office blood pressure, mainly home blood pressure, but if you read the guideline, this paper, they say that the patient has to, actually not a patient, a person, has to take the blood pressure for three to seven days daily before coming to see you. And they have to take twice each time. So, and in sitting position. So now you tell me, you are recommending Gurpreet or Narsingan or Rajiv, you're recommending, or uh, Anil, you're recommending home blood pressure, which is very fashionable, very fashionable. And you're asking them to take the blood pressure three to seven days before they see you. And you're asking them, each blood pressure should be taken twice in sitting position. Supposing they take it three to seven days and the next week they don't come or you, we are not there in the office and they will see you one month later. So what happens to those blood pressure readings that you took one month before? According to the guidelines, they have to be three to seven days before. So that is too complex. I do suggest that if you su suspect somebody has a white coat hypertension, definitely order ABPM, definitely order home BP. But I would probably ask them to take the home BP a couple of times a week but I don't think I'll ask them to take three to seven days before seeing me. And by the way, ABPM, despite although we are now using cuffless ABPM, not many people use it, but it is very fashionable. It is very, very fashionable. It is very political. Uh, if, if you want to do ABPM, I have no problem. If you want to do ABPM on every patient, I have no problem at all. So this is something you have to consider and I already commented, I'm not against risk calculation, but in a day-to-day -day practice, when you treat hypertension, blood pressure itself is a good companion with other risk factors, and you try to treat that. Uh, guidelines, uh, you know, 
international guidelines have, uh, this I have made it simple from this algorithm. Uh, blood pressure to be taken properly, risk factors, complaints, symptoms, physical exam, etc. One thing they have done, which other guidelines have not recommended that much, is they have suggested uh, in some patients to get intima media thickness as a marker of atherosclerosis and ankle brachial index as a marker of uh, either uh, atherosclerosis or blood flow pattern or vascular elasticity, however you want to do it. The paradox is these guidelines are supposed to be directed to low and middle income countries. So again, this is something that as clinicians, you just have to separate them and do what will. I would definitely do an echo. I would definitely do uh, in fact, I would prefer echo over ECG and the lab BUN creatinine urinalysis. They're nothing different than that. And these are good uh, recommendations that they have done under the age of 65, 130 by 80. If less than 65, 140 by 90. One should achieve the This is again, I have simplified from this algorithm. The step one is. Uh, dual combination of RAS plus CCB. Now we can argue about beta blocker and a diuretic. Now step two, same thing in higher doses. Step three is triple combination with a diuretic. Step four with aldosterone antagonist. Now the, the, the thinking that you already have is what about the role of beta blockers and diuretics, particularly in when they talk about low and middle income countries. In fact, low and middle income countries are the most experienced with diuretics and beta blockers than other countries. So this is a paradox that we have to resolve for the benefit of the patient. One could argue that for a diuretic, one should not wait, uh, especially low dose diuretic, one should not wait that long to the towards stage one could introduce daily. And one could argue also argue to introduce a beta blocker in the paradigm of treating you should introduce beta blocker in a paradigm of treating. Here they have suggested that they should recommend thiazide like diuretic. And they have mentioned in these guidelines, use thiazide only if thiazide like diuretics are not available. In other words, let me put it very bluntly, if chlorthalidone or indopamide are not available, use hydrochlorothiazide. That's what they're saying. Uh, that's exactly they're saying, but it's interesting. It's a very strong recommendation, a very, very, very powerful recommendation that you restrict thiazides only if the other uh, chlorthalidone or indopamide are not available. Very, very daring, very daring recommendation and actually very correct recommendation. Uh, nothing new about uh, secondary forms of hypertension, pregnancy, they, they have given when to work up, resistant hypertension, they have actually put Indians as high risk group. Now, combination therapy has to be initial as much as possible. And uh, let me mention how quickly you should reduce the blood pressure. When you want to achieve the goal blood pressure, you should try to achieve the goal blood pressure within three to six months of starting the treatment. And this is in a study from Sistior, when they reduce the blood pressure rapidly, by rapidly, I mean days and weeks, not seconds. When I say rapidly, people have a grand mal seizure convulsion. Dr. Ram is saying, make my blood pressure 50 by 10, 90 by 40, no, no, no. I don't mean rapidly means, don't wait for the patient's next birthday. Try to achieve the BP before the patient's next birthday, before his family gives him a cake, which is high in caloric and carbohydrate content and probably has metabolic syndrome. Before he enjoys the next year's cake, try to be BP down. Within three to six months, you have to do it. And same thing in the value trial, those patients who achieve the BP within six months shown here, they had a better outcome than people who achieved the BP later on. So ladies and gentlemen, when you want to treat hypertension, treat hypertension. Don't wait for something to happen before you reach the goal levels of BP. Combination therapy is recommended. This is a slide using ABPM. In the red color is the baseline BP. 
in the green color is uh, telmisartan, in the orange color is amlodipine. You see telmisartan and amlodipine lower the BP nicely by themselves, but if you combine them in the blue color, the BP reduction is greater. So ladies and gentlemen, it is very simple common sense that you, when you combine two classes of drugs that work, you combine them, they work with greater efficacy. You are boosting their antihypertensive efficacy. This is a study that was done uh, in India. Uh, Dr. Parikh uh, is uh, familiar with this study. I don't have the baseline uh, BP. Uh, Anil, if you remember, please uh, uh, educate me later on. I don't know why I don't have the baseline BP. But after four weeks, you will see those patients who were on combination of telmisartan and chlorothalidone, they had a greater fall in blood pressure compared to those who were on telmisartan and hydrochlorothiazide. So, appears to chlorothalidone is a better choice uh, for reducing the BP. And then you, combination therapy also reduces the risk of ankyl doesn't eliminate, reduces the risk of uh, ankyl edema from calcium channel blocking drugs. Now, chlorothalidone was suggested by the previous guidelines and indirectly in the current guidelines based upon the studies that are shown there, a number of studies have shown. The first study is a hypertension detection follow-up program where patients who had so-called stage one hypertension, when they were exposed to chlorothalidone, they had better outcome. And 24 hour blood pressure studies have shown the nocturnal uh, hypertension is reduced much more with chlorothalidone compared to hydrochlorothiazide. Remember, hydrochlorothiazide also lowers the BP there. It lowers the BP. It is not an indictment against hydrochlorothiazide, but chlorothalidone reduces more compared to hydrochlorothiazide because of its mechanism of action. Now, when you choose combination therapy, try to use combinations which have equal duration of action. For example, take two long-acting drugs. Don't combine one long-acting with one short-acting. That means you're putting too much pressure, too much pressure in, uh, on the long acting drug to pull the, to pull the short acting drug, too much pressure on uh, this thing. So it is, uh, it is just like asking uh, Rahul Dravid to come higher up in the batting order. Too much strain, you don't want to do that. So, uh, Try to use two long-acting drugs which work with each other and don't put tension on uh, the other drug. Beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers have not been the darling of guideline committees. Uh, except European guidelines uh, who condemned beta blockers be before, they have embraced it in the last guidelines and Indian guidelines have uh, retained beta blockers. You will notice here old studies, whether you are young or old, your risk of cardiovascular events is reduced by 14 or 11 percent when you use beta blocker as a combination therapy. So beta blockers in general are helpful. We're talking about non-etanol beta blockers, non-etanol beta blockers. This is a study with metoprolol, which is a non-etanol beta blocker showing that it is useful in primary prevention secondary prevention, and also heart failure, minute heart failure study. So non etanol beta blockers are quite effective in reducing morbidity and mortality. And in many of Indian patients, beta blockers should be used uh, because we have a lot of experience with beta blockers in this country, either as monotherapy or usually with combination therapy. So ladies and gentlemen, now we have come back full circle. Uh, Gurpreet, uh, you can share this slide if you want. I have added the third bar to what we have done before. I've added that uh, ISH global uh, definition of 130 by 85, but the rest of the slide does not change. So the goal blood pressure, ladies and gentlemen, if you saw that they recommend 130 by 80, so you have three levels of BP. To me, trust me, I don't have any ulterior motive other than to reduce the public health burden, disease burden in India. 
whatever guidelines you want to do, whichever spiritual lord that you want to appeal, appeal does not matter. I do not want to know how they look, but ultimately you have to recognize yourself and reduce the blood pressure to what is recommended by all the guidelines. One comment is that you should start the treatment early. There is no reason when you tell somebody you have hypertension, there is no point in delaying the treatment. At least put them on treatment step number one, which is non-pharmacological treatment. Give it on a prescription, the prescription number one. Start something, but don't wait for some time because if you wait, the, our patients will infer that you're not dealing with serious condition. You're not dealing with fever. You're not dealing with bronchial asthma. They know that. But it means they feel that you, you yourself are doubtful whether it should be treated. So they feel that my doctor himself or herself is doubtful. And then you combine the doubt with the patient's doubt and the patient's attendant doubt then this is what is known as peaking of COVID. This is what happens, the peaking of the blood pressure. So ladies and gentlemen, there is no auspicious time. There is no inauspicious time. There is no lagan time. There is no muhurat time. And then uh, there is no correct column because nursing is there. You, the best time to treat hypertension is when you diagnose hypertension. No other reason, no other season, that is the best time to treat. I am not saying put a bunch of medicines in the patient's mouth. I'm only saying start the treatment because when you start early, you reduce the prevalence of hypertension. When you start late, the prevalence of hypertension is unabated. So very, very important. So ladies and gentlemen, in the time that uh, we had, I have given you a kind of an overview of the guidelines in general, taking advantage of published guidelines until recently, the most recent guidelines, Indian Hypertension Guidelines, International Society of Hypertension Guidelines, preceded by European guidelines, which were preceded by American guidelines. All of them are towards aggressive control of hypertension, all of them appear to have the same target, same goal. So they want you to take the patient to the same station. But which train do you want to recommend? Because all the trains, I'm not talking about the trains that are running now. I'm not, not, I'm not talking about Samara trains. That's a different issue. I'm talking about the trains where you really want to achieve in a comfortable way. The station is the same that you, you bought the ticket, the ticket is the same, which train you want to take. Ultimately, you're going to get down at the same thing. And that is the challenge we have. I hope that uh, I have clarified to some extent the little bit of complexity in those algorithms on those flow diagrams, a little bit of complexity is there. Uh, optimal, essential, Thoda dur, thoda bahar, thoda niche, thoda piche. I, I hope that I remove some of these adjectives so that ultimately you are the custodian of the patient's health and you do what is right for the patient. With or without guidelines, you do what is right for the patient. But guidelines will just give you a little bit of support. They hold your hand uh, towards it. But as it is, having gone to medical college, having <coughs> graduation, having done uh, you are in a great shape to treat hypertension. As a, as a skilled doctor, uh, you, no guidelines can beat a skilled doctor. A skilled doctor always beats the guidelines uh, because you're seeing the patients, you're taking the pulse. And I do want to mention on a lighter vein, uh, in some of the earlier JNCs, 
uh, I mention it with all due respect to people who wrote this report. Very wonderful people, hardworking people. There are three or four uh, people in one of the committees who never me measured the blood pressure in their life. The reason they didn't measure is they didn't have to. They didn't have to. They are in basic sciences. They are in epidemiology. They are statisticians. And they do a wonderful job in their field. So they are doing a wonderful job. So what I'm trying to do is a skilled doctor is always superior to the guidelines in doing what is right for the patient. Because I always say that when you close the door of the examining room, or if you don't have the luxury of room, when you draw the curtain of the examining bed, there are only two people there, you and the patient. There's nobody there and you do what is right for the patient. Often you're in line with the guideline committee, but don't these guideline committees give you complexity because uh, it's, uh, you know, changing the topic, the renal denervation therapy, they call it simplicity, but complex. It may, it's not simplicity trial, it's a complexity trial. Now we are making complexity of the guidelines to more simplicity. So simplicity should apply to treatment of hypertension, not to renal denervation, because this is the people that we treat on a daily basis. With those remarks, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, panelists and organizers, let me offer my appreciation for asking me to participate in this dialogue. Thank you, sir, uh, for this uh, lovely deliberation. And friends, you will all agree an expert is truly a person who can simplify things. And uh, we have had uh, mention of cakes, we have had mentions of Rahul Dravid, and uh, we have had of previous, uh, aspects of treatment of hypertension. And you will all agree it was a masterly presentation in which uh, Dr. Venkatram has emphasized that guidelines are only, as the word itself says, there to guide us. Do not get bogged down by these guidelines. And you will appreciate that his uh, brain was functioning all the time while he was guiding us to make the things simple. If there is one lesson in this, one of the best lectures on hypertension that I have uh, heard, it is to keep it simple, to control the blood pressure of your patients, to use these various guidelines to guide you. But ultimately, as he rightly said, the purpose of all these endeavors is to uh, improve our patient care. And it is between you and your patient how best to control their blood pressure and so reduce their risks. Friends, we have two panelists today who will be discussing. They will be giving their impressions on this masterly presentation by Dr. Venkatram. Each time I listen to him, I learn a lot about hypertension. We will listen to these two experts, Dr. Narasinghan from, uh, from Tamil Nadu. He is the president of the Indian Society of Hypertension. He's been a reviewer of these guidelines a rare honor to have anyone. And he's also the vice chairman of the Lipid Association of India. He's the managing director of SNN Specialities Clinic and is an adjunct professor to the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University. Dr. Narsingan for his impressions first on this uh, guidelines and the masterly presentation by Sir, where he has simplified the management of hypertension how best and given us a lot of confidence that we should <clears throat> get bogged down by algorithms, by risk calculators, but manage our patients with basic common sense and our knowledge. Dr. Narsingan, please. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it is indeed a pressure for me to listen to Dr. Venkat Esram uh, because I must congratulate him for uh, dissecting out the entire aspects of uh, 2020 ISH guidelines. In fact, he started talking about the, the essential and the optimal. In fact, I was also wondering why these new terminologies were introduced by these guideline developers. When I saw the first document which I received, 
it was creating a lot of confusion in my mind and i had to go through the entire article in fact the standards of care was divided into two portions one is essential standards of care the other one is the optimal standards of care the essential standards of care are probably representing only for the lower income group of people in whom blood pressure control is a must we need to take care of those people who are coming from low income or middle income countries where you need to have the basic things not only for diagnosis even for the treatment part of it so that is essential it is a must that should be followed by those people in those countries the optimal is backed up by evidence the evidence has come from number of guidelines whenever the guidelines are published we always talk about evidence where does evidence come from the evidence come from one randomized control trials number two meta analysis these are the things which will pave the way for these guideline developers to come out with a new recommendation what these people did to categorize that as an optimal standards of care is intended mainly to cater to the needs of people who are from higher income group or people who can afford they must go for an extended laboratory investigation an extended care in the form of for example ct scan mri scan to identify the problem the carotid intima medial thickness the ankle brachial index and then the the for echocardiography or the stress echocardiography to do whatever you want including the renal artery angiogram or a peripheral angiogram to look for the so called complications which are seen in people with the hypertension so optimal care is actually backed up with evidence it is intended for high risk group people and at the same time for people who are coming from higher socio economic status the countries which are dominated for example we have received the guidelines mainly from countries like united states or europe or uk the nice guidelines ecc guidelines yes guidelines all those guidelines are coming mainly from the people who are in the higher category so backed up by evidence you need to cater to the needs of people who are in the higher income group that they can afford any sort of investigations for us to make a proper diagnosis of hypertension and the complications the next part sir was trying to talk about the classification of hypertension what is normal everybody thinks this 128 is normal that was not touched by any of the guidelines in the past but now surprisingly the international society has come to label it as 130 or 85 should be considered as normal in fact i need to appreciate the efforts taken by international society of hypertension which involved newer modalities of creating awareness among the public among the population among the general public the newer modality was the may measurement of blood pressure may month measurement of blood pressure which was introduced by neil polter which attracted the attention of almost all healthcare providers including the general practitioners the physicians the cardiologists i think our country through indian society of hypertension has contributed more than 2.5 lakh candidates who were diagnosed either as hypertension or people who are taking treatment for hypertension with a blood pressure measure but to create an awareness the internet society has started doing this sort of uh, uh, activity this has given them lot of opportunities to go into the details of normal blood pressure among the population studied then they were able to come to a reasonable conclusion that the normal blood pressure can be 130 over 85 so i presume that this is i presume that that should be the truth from the guideline developers and then the the next one sir was talking about the diuretics the diuretics essential or what is required for lower income group of people or middle income countries if you don't have the thiazide like diuretic you need to probably depend only on thiazide diuretic like your hydrochlorothiazide which may be probably cheaper in that particular part of the country which can be used by those people but as when we talk about the evidence come to the optimal standards of care we talk only about the that the thiazide like diuretic like your chlorothalidone or indepamide which had been backed up with a lot of evidence 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 is not the question of compare between these two if it's not available go for hydrochlorothiazide that's the recommendation the second part of it the third part of it is the the diagnosis of hypertension which was actually 
stimulated by the publication of sprint study where unattended blood pressure measurement was made this unattended blood pressure estimation is it correct it also endorses yes it is correct but we cannot probably exactly diagnose hypertension through this unattended ways of measuring blood pressure it always requires out of office or out of unattended activity we should probably measure the blood pressure to come to a conclusion that the patient is suffering from hypertension or not that's the next point the, the one that probably uh, uh, requires uh, some clarification is that they had seen people south asians or at a high risk of developing a cardiovascular disease with a with a night time blood pressure early morning blood pressure which has been documented with a lot of inputs so the early morning blood pressure should be brought down comfortably the night time blood pressure increase should also be brought down comfortably to have the relief from cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in this group of patients in whom you are taking care i think that has been highlighted asians are at a high risk of having a early morning blood pressure or night time blood pressure that has to be controlled properly south asians particularly indians are at a high risk of developing cardiovascular disease because of the concomitant problems of metabolic syndrome as well as diabetes that was highlighted i must also congratulate the guideline developers because they had introduced the metabolic syndrome is a separate chapter in which you should not neglect even the small rise in the blood pressure 130 over 85 that is the criteria given for metabolic syndrome diagnosis and remember you can recollect 130 or 85 the pressure whether it is a treatment or a new patient so they are giving importance to metabolic syndrome which has to be controlled properly after lifestyle modification the blood pressure treatment is necessary for these individuals of course they are they had actually given a lot of recommendations almost similar to the recommendations given by other guidelines it is not in any way to differ from the guidelines what has been already published like acc or esc guidelines they concur with the views expressed by them simply they wanted to create an awareness to cater to the needs of low and middle income group of people divide them into two groups and whatever is available let them take it whatever medicine that is available for hypertension try to give it to them and save them from cardiovascular morbidity and mortality that is their aim and i fully endorse to their views endorse to their approach endorse the simplicity in approaching these problems of hypertension not only in the diagnosis but also in the management this is as far as the introduction and the as a international society guidelines the Thank one you. important thing that they have again addressed is that lipids associated with the hypertension need to be controlled properly and the goal should be with the risk when the patient has already suffered from an event to bring it down to the levels of 55 mg which i had separately sent them an article saying that it should be less than 55 mg they had incorporated this number in those people who had developed an event following hypertension that's for my case thank you very much sir, dr wonder sir for giving the opportunity to talk and then to to uh, congratulate dr venkates ram for giving us lots and lots of information on hypertension Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Narsingan, for your very critical assessment of these uh, guidelines. And uh, we have another very uh, erudite speaker, analyzer, and assessor of uh, medical literature and uh, data. A personal friend of mine, actually, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal from the Jaswant Rai Speciality Hospital in Meerut. He has uh, he holds the Limca Book of Records for implanting maximum number of free pacemakers in this country. He has been awarded Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018 and uh, multiple other awards for in being an inspiration for uh, doctors across the country. And he is a great teacher uh, for non-communicable diseases. And we are all looking forward to your comments, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal. on these new guidelines which have come which have so beautifully been assessed analyzed and explained to us uh, by uh, professor venkat asram over to dr rajiv agarwal for his thoughts on these guidelines thank you dr gurpreet wander and uh, let me say big thank to who attended uh, 
such a wonderful uh, guidelines and uh, i'll crystallize what you wanted to say only clever people can do simple things so doing simple thing is very very difficult uh, regarding the guideline goals i look at uh, three or four aspects the guidelines has introduced for the first time a cut off of diastolic 85 and uh, which is not there in other guidelines probably this is a new dimension and i think what dr ram keeps on preaching that pick up one guidelines one of the guidelines and follow it with heart you will do uh, marvelously well so the one change which has occurred to my mind is the cut off of 85 the treatment goal remains uh, let me say essential and optimal i would like to substitute the word optimal because ram said very precisely that if the risk profile of the patient is high with the going into the complexities of various calculator simple things he has got albumino he has cc right down 27 and i think this is as a after a sprint a sprint whatever you may say it brought down bp to 120 80 and if some risk score average framing risk score of a sprint is sprint trial 25 means all these patients were not the equivalent they were not young hypertensives they were with patient and that is what these guidelines consists don't to the complexities of the guidelines risk purpose to have something like 120 not less than younger the patient better it is older the patient list which comes to my mind so are very precise they do not favor anything they favor calcium channel blocker and asarbs and the only thing is which they mentioned very specifically is chlorothaladon thiazide like diuretic can only be used when chlorothaladon is not available so that mandates the third drug to be chlorothaladon so that is another very very interesting thing to my mind i somehow feel i need to be uh, made clever by you guys that why guidelines do not recommend that time dosage of the drugs we have ample ample volume of data which suggest there is having one pill to a patient why do they leave this gap open that it can be given any time why they do not mandate it that it should be given back time so that is another point which somehow has been missed by all the guidelines the timing of the drug if you are using a single pill then uh, lastly i want to say a word about usage of aspirin and statin if you have more comorbidities then you have more likely you will end up using aspirin and uh, statin aspirin is not and statin should not be used in every patient who is low risk first time detected young hypertensive without risk profiling so if you are average to high or very high risk probably you have to cut out a uh, aspirin statin use because these two drugs will further modify the patient and uh, that is all i wanted to say about it and I'm sure dr ram will enlighten us further that how to uh, go forward and once again i thank him the guidelines were simple but dr ram has made it simpler for us and they are very very clinical guidelines and i'm sure it will translate into lot of clinics where the patients and the community can be benefited by the simplicity of the guidelines thank you thank you uh, dr rajiv agarwal for these beautiful comments and the buzzword today is keep it simple and uh, keep it um, easy 
but control the blood pressure as effectively as you can. Uh, one is very comfortable with these guidelines, but just as uh, Sir said, there are some reservations regarding the word essential and optimal because all individuals have to be treated equally. And in fact, India constitutes 18% of the world population and South Asians constitute almost 23% of the world population. And as he showed beautifully, all guidelines, be it American, European, they show that South Asian risk of coronary artery disease is 1.4 times as compared to Caucasians or other races. So blood pressure controls have to be uh, more effective in South Asians because we are a high risk population, whether we belong to a low middle income country or whatever, it doesn't make a difference. We harbor syndrome X, we have multiple risk factors. And so blood pressure control has to be effective. That is what Dr. Ram was uh, suggesting to us. We've had some uh, number of questions, but uh, as they say, uh, man is a selfish animal. And uh, since uh, Dr. Venkatram is there, I, there are multiple beautiful things in these guidelines. But sir, I just want one of my um, things to be answered by you before I go on to questions. Uh, in the lifestyle modification section, I see a section on healthy drinks. I'll just read from the guidelines and I would need your comments on these because it says moderate consumption of coffee, green and black tea. Other beverages that can be beneficial include carcade, hibiscus tea, pomegranate juice, beetroot juice, and cocoa. So these are some of the non-pharmacological measures which have been emphasized in these trials, in these guidelines. Uh, your comments on this, uh, uh, this dietary component, sir. Uh, has to be unmuted. Uh, the control has to unmute, sir. Uh, sir, uh, he has to unmute your mic. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm glad that uh, you 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 caught that thing. I think the reason they were mentioned is uh, the, these kinds of drinks uh, are widely uh, used in certain sections of the world. Uh, the beetroot, pomegranate, and the tea, uh, hibiscus tea, uh, etc. Cocoa, uh, especially in uh, South America, because of uh, their community use. Uh, they have mentioned it. Of course, there are no trials because nobody knows uh, how much uh, promagana juice you have to drink and what happens if you do something else that negates it. But, but uh, because of patients ask this as a, as a, as a social uh, platform, they have mentioned it without the evidence. So I think it is appropriate, but I don't think uh, on a day-to-day -day one would just ask patients to take this if the patient says, sir, I'm taking a lot of promagenate juice, I'm taking uh, green tea and all these things, uh, uh, you say yes, uh, because at least they are recommended. So this gives you a little bit of a ammunition to agree with the patients who say they're doing this. So it gives you a little bit, actually they're helping you without any, any scientific basis. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, they are they're healthy drinks, uh, no, no studies have shown, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they're, they're acceptable because I don't think they, they do cause much harm. Most important thing is none of these juices cause harm. I think some fruit juice may be high in potassium and maybe the high potassium source food can uh, bring down the blood pressure. And other thing is a uh, high source of antioxidants, although effect on blood pressure not known, but uh, Antioxidants may be beneficial, as you said, uh, but the potassium rich may uh, food may uh, bring out bring down blood pressure. Uh, there one are more things that this one right. more thing that these people have added is that reduce the stress by doing meditation. There's again another important thing that they stressed, which was not found in any of the guidelines published in the past. Yes, right. this is for your. <laughs> so uh, oh. we can have um, comments by any one of the uh, two panelists or uh, the chief speaker because there are multiple questions and it's like a um, like a fast forward round, sir. Because uh, as many as we can address in the next 10-15 minutes, uh, the there is a question from Doctor 
M. Jaya Raja from Chennai. Uh, please comment on amlodipine versus silnidipine. Calcium channel blockers, sir. Any, any comments on choice of uh, calcium channel blockers? Uh, me or uh, others also uh, are you asking me, Gurpreet? Yes, sir. Well, in, in this, uh, this is this is a question that always comes up. Uh, both are equally effective in treating hypertension. Uh, Silnidipine, due to its mechanism of action, appears to have an effect on not aggravating proteinuria, and because of its effect, not mm -hmm. accelerating the heart rate. But the outcome trials with, uh, M with CCBs, uh, outcome trials, I'm talking about uh, the death or morbidity, hospitalization, revascularization, those data are only available with amlodipine starting from about 25 years ago. So all the outcome data, uh, not surrogate markers, that the patient is living or suffering with a complication, they have always been with uh, amlodipine. If you look at all the outcome studies, they have been with amlodipine. But efficacy is very, very similar. So then it comes to what you want to use. If you want to reduce the blood pressure only, either one is fine. But, but if you want to look at the outcome, uh, they have almost exclusively uh, the long-term outcome trials of stroke, heart failure, coronary artery disease, revascularization, hospitalization, they have always been with amlodipine. But if you look at the surrogate markers, proteinuria, heart rate, LVH, they have been demonstrated with uh, silnidipine. Dr. Rajiv wants to make a comment on this. Uh, I just want to add on what Dr. Ram has said. Guidelines had been very smart and very simplified. They say A plus C. They do not differentiate between A, C, R, Bs, and C means calcium channel blocker. What Dr. Ram has said is the truth, and uh, they differ in surrogate endpoint, but the outcome trials are not in favor of any one calcium channel blocker. So it is you did recognize blood pressure and control it. That is a bigger issue than the choice of agent. It, they have used the word in every guideline A plus C. So C means every calcium channel blocker. Oh. Uh, Dr. Paresh from Ahmedabad wants to know in recent era of COVID, what is recommendation for ARB ACE inhibitors in treatment scheduled for hypertension? I think I can take this yes. uh, because it's the easiest. Uh, the recommendations and guidelines say those patients who are on ACE inhibitors or ARBs, they should be continued and you should not change. In fact, there is uh, most of the guidelines, the Indian guidelines by the CSI and the APA suggested the same. And now there is data coming that the ACE inhibitors might even be protective for these people. So do not withdraw and do not deprive these patients of um, the ACE inhibitors or ARBs, whatever your patients are taking. The next question is actually from Dr. Kaushik Nag from Agartala. What's the role of ARMI in management of hypertension? Not I think doctor, yes. Uh, Dr. Yes, Ram sir. has had a very long uh, discourse. Any one of the other two want to take? Or yeah. Wants to, yeah. You see, you will be surprised to know the Arnies came for blood pressure. They didn't, they didn't come for congestive heart failure or LV dysfunction. So Arnies were initially designed for hypertension. And I'll say there is no recommendation in guidelines regarding Arnie. But it is my experience, and I do not know how you will take it. Patients who are refractory to hypertension, instead of adding fourth drug, fifth drug, sixth drug, I have put them on Arnie and Chlorthalidone. They do extremely well. I'll bite away another 30, 40% patients, say 200 milligram of Vimada with Chlorthalidone, which takes away at least three, four drugs. So I do use it, maybe two patients in a month, maybe 10 patients in a year, I use it routinely as an antihypertensive drug. There are no fear attached because you are not using it as a step one drug. I use it in refractory hypertension patient where I'm struggling to control. Well, thank you. My comments on these are, Arnie's are not antihypertensive drugs. They should not be used for hypertension, yes. but you should use them when patients have heart failure, 
when they it have is. reduced ejection fraction, they are of proven benefit. So hypertensives with heart failure reduced ejection fraction, they are to yeah. be used. They impart some benefit to patients with hypertension with preserved ejection, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction also. But they truly are not antihypertensive drugs and they should be avoided because we have very effective and good antihypertensive agents. I have a question uh, for Dr. No, uh, Pari. Can uh, uh, move on? Can uh, be given safely to elderly? I'm saying just in refractory hypertension. That's fine. Well, let's move on. I think we don't have that. Yeah. Can chlorothalidone be given yeah. safely to elderly population? What is the risk of electrolyte disturbance in this population if given? Dr. Parikh. I think uh, you can give it in uh, uh, elderly patients. I think there are studies basically in elderly people only. And uh, for that, actually, uh, since we have large experience with the 12.5 milligram hydrochlorothiazide in our country, both alone and combinations, we have uh, for that purpose came out specifically, specifically with the 6.25 milligram dose, which actually is tolerated much better in most of most of these patients. And uh, the TRIAM study, which was done in Sri Lanka, where the low doses of all three drugs uh, were used, telmisartan, amlodipine, and chlorotheridone, they used a 12.5 milligram dose. And then we suggested that you know 6.25 uh, will have much less electrolyte disturbances in these patients. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, there are. I think. Uh, uh, shall I? Uh, shall I, sir? Shall I add one more point? Yes. Chlorothalidone. I think if we can recollect all the trials, the good old trial, SHIP trial, systolic hypertension, the elderly program trial, which had used the chlorothalidone, had come out with the beautiful data. A 22 years follow-up had shown the longevity in those people who have been taking this diuretic chlorothalidone. Correct. Thank you. Sir. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Dr. Naveen Kumar from uh, Vishakhapatnam wants to know why beta blockers are not at all there in your recommendations. Well, they are in the recommendations, uh, not in these guidelines, but Dr. Ram beautifully explained to you that for specific indications, patients with heart failure, patients with coronary artery disease, patients with increased sympathetic activity in young age, these are uh, agents to be used. And as he said, the Indian guidelines do mention, but certainly as antihypertensive agents, beta blockers have receded in terms, whereas the other uh, three group of uh, drugs, the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, diuretics, and calcium channel blockers hold their fort. He also wants to know alpha beta blocker, where do they stand? Uh, uh, Dr. Ram, sir, will you like to take this up? Alpha beta blockers such as uh, Lebitolol uh, or Carvedilol. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Lebitolol is a. Uh, Carvedilol. 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 Carvedilol does work for hypertension. Uh, actually, Carvedilol was developed mainly for hypertension, uh, but then uh, they did not introduce it for hypertension because there were already 10 uh, beta blockers in the market. But Carvedilol uh, can lower the BP but you have to use the doses higher than what you use for congestive heart failure. And there's nothing wrong if you're using 20, 30, 40 milligram of carbidolol, but uh, it has not been subjected to proper studies uh, of uh, efficacy. It does lower the BP, no doubt about it. But uh, the dosage and what combination, we do not know. But for some reason, if you want to use carvedilol for hypertension, I, I suspect as a part of combination therapy, then you try to use it at a higher dose than heart failure doses. Uh, your comment on labitalol also, sir, please. Just uh, labitalol, labitalol uh, I don't know why, uh, you know, there are certain situations in life which are not explained by science. Uh, and uh, that always perplexed me, uh, labitalol. A uh, lot of studies on libitolol for hypertension uh, in, uh, and the dosage range is 200 milligram to 1200 milligram. And the postural hypotension is only at doses like 600 or 800 milligram. But you don't see it at 200, 400 milligram. It's a, it's a good uh, beta blocker, uh, but not subjected to outcome trials. Because it is not uh, like uh, we have outcome trials, uh, as you know, with bisoprolol, you have outcome trials with metoprolol, you have one outcome trial with nebivalol, 
and plenty of outcome trials, all the negative with etanolol, but nobody has subjected libitolol to an outcome trial. So the only thing is, we, it is, can be used as an antihypertensive drug, hoping that it is helpful for the patient. One more thing I want to mention is, although Dr. Parikh is here as a pharmacology, clinical pharmacologist, although it is an alpha beta blocker according to pharmacopoeia, but clinically it acts as a beta blocker when you take it by mouth. When you take the libitolol by mouth, which is, the, which is what is required for hypertension, it all acts only as a beta blocker unless you go to very high doses okay. where the alpha blockade comes in. So the beta to alpha ratio is seven to one if you take it by mouth. But intravenously, if you give libitolol with anesthesiologists give, it is the reverse. It is more of an alpha blocker alpha. and less of a beta blocker. So it's a classical alpha beta blocker intravenously. But in clinical management of hypertension, pharmacological classification, yes, it's alpha beta blocker. Mentally, you have to think of it as a beta blocker. Thank you, sir. For you saw, yeah, one more point. useful for pre pregnancy hypertension. Pregnancy hypertension. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Singhan uh, is saying that pregnancy with hypertension, it's the drug of choice. And yes, as sir has clarified in hypertensive emergencies, actually that answers yeah. one of the questions by Siddharth Jain from Khwaja also. When patient comes with K, a hypertensive emergency for patient BP 200 by 110, what should be first IV therapy uh, to be given? Dr. Rajiv, would you like to take this? Uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv, I think we'll. Uh, 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 would you like to take it, sir, or should I answer this? You can answer it. So, for uh, high for blood pressure values of two hundred by one ten without uh, Dr. Rajiv, are you on? Indication okay. where you need to reduce it further. Even in CVAs. You are supposed to reduce not audible, not audible. Gurpreet, uh, you might want to answer it and move on. Yeah. So blood pressure by itself values do not denote a hypertensive emergency. We should distinguish between emergency and urgency. And if patient has no complication, we should manage these patients with effective oral drugs. But if the patient has an emergency, as Dr. Ram was yes. saying. Labitalol uh, is one of a very good drug for uh, intravenous usage in patients who truly have hypertensive emergencies and not just blood pressure readings, which themselves would not denote uh, an, as an emergency. Uh, there are some questions. A uh, couple of people want to know how to manage resi resistant hypertension in chronic kidney disease, a difficult problem because we cannot use um, uh, some of the commonly used drugs when creatinine values go beyond 3.5. So we need Dr. Ram's expert opinion on this because this is a difficult situation, sir. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, there, is a, there is a saying, if the blood pressure is normal, the patient does not have CKD. So CKD almost every patient with CKD at some point will develop hypertension. And patients with advancing CKD, three, four, five, they are typically, they have this kind of blood pressure because of multiple mechanisms that raise the blood pressure. The drugs that are, you should think in this patient, I'm not going to talk about the usual drugs. The things that you should think in this kind of a patient would be to think about older drugs like hydralazine with combination with a beta blocker and a diuretic, of course. 50 milligram twice a day, you can go up to 100 milligram twice a day and don't worry about drug-induced lupus, does not happen that much. Even if it happens, it's only arthralgia, but it doesn't cause pericarditis, it doesn't cause neurological lupus. The other drug which uh, one should not hesitate to use is minoxidil. People should not hesitate to use minoxidil. It is not a dangerous drug. When minoxidil was introduced, it was very special. But now it is not that special anymore. 
don't give it a status as if you, it's untouchable. <laughs> you please touch uh, minoxidil. Start with five milligram, 10 milligram, 15, 20 in combination with a beta blocker and in combination with a diuretic, always. When you use hydralazine and minoxidil, it is automatic in company with a beta blocker and a diuretic block the side effects. So these are the things. The other drug that one might think in this kind of a patient is to use a centrally acting drug, whatever your favorite is, clonidine or moxonidine. These are the three drugs that you should think about uh, refractory hypertension in CKD. The other thing that uh, one should think about is if the patient is on a thiazide a diuretic, the patient should be switched to a thiazide-like or a loop diuretic in the presence of CKD because thiazide drugs don't work. So, uh, can, I, can I just uh, interfere, sir? Sure, sir. Dr. Sure. Dr. Ram has uh, mentioned about the alpha blocker usage, particularly the other drugs. Uh, like uh, your uh, alpha beta blockers. If there is a mention about uh, doxazosin uh, in the recommendation of uh, ISH 2020, which can be selected as a fourth or the fifth drug in combination with other drugs. Doxazosin has failed to show any sort of benefit in the al -Hart study. It was stopped because of the tachyphylaxis, heart failure and all. But now getting reintroduced, uh, I don't know why, is there any evidence to say that it would probably improve the cardiovascular outcome? Is there a discussion between the right. chairperson as well as Dr. Venkat Right. Uh, yeah. I think we were having uh, questions from down south. Since I am uh, from Punjab, sir, I thought I'll take the liberty of why not picking up <laughs> from uh, my own state. Uh, there is a question by, by a very brilliant uh, physician, Ashok Kamra from Muksar. Is there any term isolated diastolic hypertension he wants to know? Any one of you? Yeah, uh, this is a, a recognized entity and this is more common in young because as you grow older, the diastolic pressure goes down. That is how the pulse pressure increases. You have aortic stiffening. So isolated diastolic hypertension is a reality and happens in younger patients where there more is neurohumoral driven. And uh, I think it needs to be treated with the same same josh and vigor as we treat uh, systolic hypertension. And you, because the definition includes both systolic and diastolic, if your diastolic is high, like isolated systolic hypertension, you have isolated diastolic hypertension, and some patients have combination of both. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are a couple of questions. There is one from, again, uh, Jalandhar City. Dr. N.K. Sharma wants to know, if blood pressure, there are issues on blood pressure fluctuations. And I'm aware Dr. Ram uh, recently wrote an editorial in Journal of Hypertension on orthostatic hypertension, resistant hypertension, and um, uh, blood pressure fluctuation. So any comments you would Aortic like to stiffness. Consider? What yes. should be the approach in, uh, in such patients? Yeah, first of all, uh, blood pressure fluctuation uh, is very common uh, if you measure the blood pressure. Uh, if you don't measure the blood pressure, it is very uncommon. So the question always has been the blood pressure variability as a risk factor for cardiovascular events because with each surge in blood pressure, there appears to be disruption of endothelial function. And therefore, the blood flow changes from lamellar blood flow, it becomes turbulent blood flow. And that can cause erosion of the endothelium. So if the patient has significant blood pressure variability, minute to minute blood pressure variability, the important thing is to control the blood pressure as effectively as possible with 24 hour uh, duration drugs. There is not much comparative trial, which drug is better to control the variability. Ultimately, the mothership is still hypertension. So the blood pressure variability is there because you are measuring it or the patient is measuring it you are going to see more and more blood pressure variability if you recommend more and more home blood pressure monitoring because they're going to report so many things. So blood pressure, uh, by the way, blood pressure variability is a pathogenetic uh, factor, but the way to curb it is to control hypertension as effectively as possible. There's no specific drugs that have been designed to reduce the blood pressure variability. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question uh, from down south. I think Dr. Narsinghan can take this. It is from Tamil Nadu. Uh, Dr. A.R. Pad Padmana Ban wants to know, uh, is ARBs, are they contraindicated above 80 years? Dr. Narsinghan, please. ARB is contraindicated. ACE inhibitors or ARBs, are they contraindicated in elderly beyond 80 years? Uh, the, the thing is, the uh, any nitrogen in aldosterone system is actually not that much active uh, in those people uh, who are elderly. So blocking the renin angiotensin system with a higher dose of ACI and ARB mm -hmm. may not be the real uh, thing that is required. You need to use it in certain situations. There's no harm in using it, but you need not go uh, and uh, update the dose in an elderly individual, thinking that the renin angiotensin aldosterone is active. No. Probably you can use it as the good drug in combination with a calcium channel blocker, in combination with a diuretic, like chlorothalidone, the small dose. This will be the ideal combination rather than increasing or updating the dose of an individual ACI or ARB in elderly population. Well, there are many more questions and uh, Dr. Rajiv wants to make a comment on this. I think let us not confuse it. If you are young, you start with ACE and ultimately get all three drugs. If you are old, you start with C and get all these three drugs. So, uh, if you are severe hypertension, you end up using all. But if you are older patient, say 60 year plus, you start with calcium channel blocker, diuretics, and ACE inhibitors. You start with A, diuretic, and calcium channel blocker. Well, uh, thank you, sir. There is some rain and uh, uh, <laughs> yes, outside. So we'll have last two comments. Uh, uh, actually, uh, two things I wanted Dr. Ram and Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Narsingan to comment upon. These are some recent, I'll just read from these guidelines and then uh, for the benefit of the audience and maybe quick comments by any one of you. They have mentioned other additional risk factors very nicely. Uh, I, re I uh, quote, elevated serum uric acid is common in patients with hypertension and should be treated with uh, uh, should be treated with diet, urate influencing drugs, losartan, fibrates, atorvastatin, or urate lowering drugs in symptomatic patients. Secondly, they have really mentioned about um, an increase in cardiovascular risk must be considered in patients with chronic inflammatory disease, chronic obstructive airway disease, psychiatric disorders, psychosocial stressors. So these are some of the risks, uh, high risk individuals who have been uh, identified. Would you like to make a comment on these, sir? Dr. If you want me to comment? Sir, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, uric acid uh, and fibrinogen, as you know, have always, uh, they always come up. Uh, epidemiologically, there is a linear relationship between uric acid and cardiovascular disease, epidemiologically. <laughs> But there are no intervention trials of reducing uric acid to see if the cardiovascular outcome changes. So uric acid is either a risk factor or a risk marker for cardiovascular disease. But whether manipulating uric acid can eliminate the risk is not known because uric acid abnormalities always occur in conjunction with other abnormalities like BP, diabetes, obesity, food habits, etc. So I think uh, clearly there is uh, excellent evidence that high uric acid, high mortality. But is it an independent risk factor is not known. Not. Or with reducing the uric acid is cost effective so that you don't cause uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome from allopurinol and become blind. Your uric acid is fine, but you can't see anything. So that you don't want to happen. And one comment uh, I want to make earlier uh, about, uh, about when talk, talk about CKD, I think now with the era uh, of combination therapy, dual combination therapy, triple combination therapy, many of these patients, as long as they're under good surveillance, they should actually be can push from resistant to responsive hypertension. And the triple combination therapies mm -hmm. that uh, at least these guidelines have recommended 
is a combination of ARB, they gave Telmisartan as an example, based upon the outcome trials, amlodipine based upon the outcome trials, chlorothaladone based upon the outcome trials. Then the other combinations can also be used, but these are very time-tested outcome uh, combinations you have to use. One comment I have with that person who asked the question, 200 or something, is uh, in those patients also, you need to bring the blood pressure towards normal at some time. Don't settle for uh, reducing by 20 by 10. So you're only making the patient uh, with some degree of hypertension. By reducing by 20, 10, you don't do anything. The patient is still hypertensive. You know, uh, if the patient is febrile, the idea is to make the patient afebrile, not less febrile. Uh, that is not the idea. Same thing in the treatment. That is the reason why this 20 by 10 is very peculiar uh, because uh, from 200 you reduce to 180, they're saying that is good enough. But uh, most definitions, 180 is high blood pressure. Uh, 180 is never called low blood pressure unless the terminology has changed. And the other thing in these guidelines, I don't know how uh, people have missed uh, or even the typographical, is uh, they are saying for 160 over 100 in that algorithm, immediate treatment is recommended, which is correct. But in the text, they will say, follow, in fact, I have written here, they say, confirm the diagnosis in few days or weeks. Excuse me, somebody has 160 or 100 and you want to use the and you want to weeks. I don't know what few means. I don't know what, eight, 10, 11. Uh, weeks, it can be two weeks or it can be 52 weeks, right? So uh, I, I think I would ignore that uh, if somebody Statement. has 160 or 100, it is hypertension. Absolutely. If you have temperature of 102, you, you don't say, let us check it after three weeks. <laughs> you did emphasize it earlier also, sir, from the value trial that treat blood pressure, early control of blood pressure, of course, not crash, bring it crashing down, but uh, relatively, the, the birthday and the cake issue we still uh, have in mind. Uh, <laughs> we are not talking of the uh, HELP syndrome, of course, which is well known to uh, all, which is characterized by pregnancy with hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets. But there is a syndrome I want uh, one of you, um, maybe Dr. Ram or uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, or Dr. Narsingan to comment. Uh, in the hypertensive emergency section, they have mentioned hypertensive thrombotic microangiopathy, severe blood pressure elevation associated with hemolysis and thrombocytopenia in the absence of other causes, which improves with good blood pressure control. Sir, in your very vast experience, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Does it happen frequently, infrequently, very infrequently? Or it's a, it's a basically, it's a, it's a classical so-called malignant hypertension. We don't use the word malignant that much anymore because we don't see it. It's a cas classical Keith Wagner malignant hypertension where there is a generation of cystocytes, there is generation of uh, uh, the, pl the platelet rupture happens. So it's a very classical, typical malignant hypertension that we don't see anymore. Uh, due to vasospasm in association with hyperviscosity in these patients. So that when you treat hypertension, uh, it actually comes down very much. And uh, there is a word uh, with this kind of a syndrome, minus hemolysis, is gaze box syndrome. You, but you don't treat that, you just treat blood pressure. Thank you, sir. I think uh, we all good things have to come uh, to an end. And uh, so for this, uh, very excellent uh, deliberative session and very participative. We will have one minute comments by all the three panelists and the chief speaker, Professor Venkat S. Ram, and then we will uh, uh, say goodbye. Maybe we can start with you, sir, take home messages as they, it's, a, it's a media uh, time when uh, in the end of any panel discussion, they give one minute last comment. So I thought maybe I can also copy that and we can have uh, last minute comments, take home messages from each one of you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ram, you can start, sir. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I sincerely hope that uh, people who logged in, who participated, I hope that they find this to be of some use in their day to day practice on uh, applying scientific advances to the advantage of the patient. 
I do hope that some of the principles that came up, either if we agree or disagree, this becomes secondary, but the principles remain strong pillars of anything, direction. So uh, I do hope that they have, uh, they, have, they have benefited from it. Ultimate beneficiary is always the patient. Then secondly, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the privilege of to be part of this panel. And I want to thank you, Gurpreet and our panelists and everybody in Arsingan and Dr. Parikh and Dr. Agarwal, everybody for our wonderful interaction and the discussion, etc. And uh, I think uh, as long as we did not cause confusion to the audience, that is a significant gain. Uh, at least in the current environment. Uh, anything you don't lose is considered a profit these days. Right. <laughs> in the difficult yeah. times. Yeah. 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 I, I think uh, the entire discussion was very good. Instead of uh, making uh, people to get confused, I think we gave, gave them some sort of clarity in our approach in the management of hypertension. There are a number of guidelines. You can follow any of these guidelines like ACCHA or European Society guidelines or Indian guidelines that Dr. Wander was part of it, or you can follow the, the discussion what was actually today's discussion about 2020 International Society guidelines. My final message is that guidelines that are not followed are of no value. It is not like you are calculating the risk score. You can neglect it. But whereas the guidelines, you need to follow at least one guideline to be very, very careful in treating your patient. That is my humble request to all the audience who have been witnessing this show. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Raji, please. I've had two slogans to the whole discussion. Uh, and these slogans are given by Hypertension Society on World Hypertension Day. That was 17th. So they gave us triple M, May Measurement Month. Mm -hmm. That means each individual should get in the world this BP measured in the month of May. That is just a slogan they created. And the, second, the message of World Hypertension Day's slogan for this year is measure it, control it, and live longer. What Dr. Ram, measure it, control it, and live longer. That suffices the whole symposium. Thank you, sir. Live longer and uh, without senile dementia, as was the opening slide that we had. Uh, Dr. Pring, Pring, on, on behalf Hi. of uh, Dr. Narsingan Indian Society of Hypertension, which is, uh, which, is, which is the one that governs World Hypertension Day in India, this yeah. year the World Hypertension Day is on October 17th. Oh, it's delayed uh, because of COVID? Yeah, oh, because yeah. of COVID. COVID yeah. uh, I think they have released their slogan for the year. Yeah, right. Uh, Dr. Parikh, some uh, last yeah. one? Last May, I would, first of all, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to thank all of you and uh, Dr. Gurpreet for presiding the, uh, the whole event and, you know, conducting the program in a, in a way that clinicians can understand. And Professor Venkatram, I think uh, over the years, I have been interacting with him. And as you very rightly said, that we gain more and more knowledge by just listening to him and his, his vast experience on hypertension. I think I recall that before the 2017 uh, ACCHA guideline came and before the European guidelines came, he just said that 13080 is going to be the, uh, the blood pressure which will be uh, required to control after, just after the sprint trial was released in 2015. At that time, he said that 13080 is going to be the new guideline and new control. I think it is coming out to be true with most guidelines asking us to control the goal blood pressure to 130-80. I think a very, very important message. And uh, Dr. Narsingan has uh, done a good comment. And Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, as such, uh, is, was very uh, nice and clinically very good. So it's my pleasure and privilege to thank all of you. I think with that message, I would like to call well, it. Have a great uh, weekend, all of you. And uh, thank you uh, for thank you. all the participants and all of you who have logged in. Uh, goodbye. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.